This week we start Paul's second letter to the Thessalonians. And chapter one, we'll be studying the first chapter tonight. This morning we'd like to draw your attention to verse 10 of chapter one, where Paul speaks of the coming again of Jesus Christ. And that when he shall come, to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all of them that believe because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Jesus is coming again. This is the hope that has been given to us through the scriptures, throughout all of the scriptures, that there is a better day coming that Jesus shall come and establish God's kingdom upon the earth, a kingdom of righteousness, of joy, of peace. Better days are coming. But before the better days come, as Jesus said, evil days shall wax worse and worse. Before he establishes his kingdom, he is going to destroy the kingdom of darkness that has been in rebellion against him. The kingdoms of this world, which are controlled by the powers of darkness, will be destroyed and he shall establish his righteous reign over the earth. I love to preach on the love of God. I love to teach concerning the grace of God, concerning the mercies of God, the goodness of God. These are themes that I relish. I find it difficult to speak on the judgment of God. And yet, the scriptures teach that the day of God's judgment is coming. And if I did not teach on the judgment of God, I would be derelict as a minister of God to my obligation and responsibility of sharing with you the full nature of God. When Paul met with the Ephesian elders for the last time, he said, I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have declared unto you the whole counsel of God. And if someone is only talking of the love of God or the goodness of God or the uh, forgiveness and mercy and grace, they are not giving you the whole counsel of God because throughout the scriptures we are warned that God will one day judge the wicked for their wickedness. He will judge the world for its wickedness before he establishes his kingdom of righteousness and peace. But know this, the Lord is coming again. He promised his disciples that he would come again. When he was with them that last night before his crucifixion, he had been talking to them things that troubled their minds. He said, I'm going to go away from you now, and where I'm going, you cannot come. They said, Lord, where are you going that we can't come? And they were disturbed by the strange things that he was saying. And recognizing their hearts being sort of perturbed, he said, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. For in my father's house there are many mansions and if it were not so, I would have told you. And I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, 
I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Promised. I'm going to come again. I'm going away to prepare a place, but I'll come again and receive you unto myself. In Matthew 24, Jesus said, Then shall they see the sign of the Son of Man coming with clouds and great glory. Matthew 25, Jesus said, For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. There were many, many prophecies that spoke of the first coming of Jesus Christ. Over 300 conditions that had to be fulfilled by the Messiah. Jesus fulfilled the prophecies precisely, completely, that dealt with the first coming of the Messiah. There are equally as many prophecies concerning the second coming of Jesus. And even as he fulfilled those prophecies of the first coming, you can be assured and rest assured that he will indeed fulfill the prophecies of his second coming. There are events that are going to happen in the world, the Bible tells us, that will be precursors of the Lord's return. The things that the Bible spoke about as precursors to the return of Jesus Christ are the very things that you can read in your newspapers today that are happening on the earth. The signs of the times. As Jesus said, when you see these things begin to come to pass, look up, lift up your head, for your redemption is getting close. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, the promise is, Behold, he comes with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all of the families of the earth shall wail because of him. A very similar prophecy was given by Zechariah. He said, I will pour out upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourns for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one is in bitterness for his firstborn. Looking on him whom they have pierced. Zechariah said that before Jesus was ever pierced. John tells us now that they will look upon him that they have pierced and they will mourn. Zechariah also spoke about the mourning as for an only son. Matthew 24, Jesus said, Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall the families of the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming with clouds and with power and with great glory. When Jesus was with his disciples for the last time before his ascension into heaven, he was with them there on the Mount of Olives, and he was instructing them, go back to Jerusalem, wait there for the promise of the Father, which I've been talking to you about. And when he had spoken these things, while they were beholding him, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they were looking steadfastly towards the heavens as he went up, behold, there were two men who stood by them in white apparel and said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye here gazing into heaven? This same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come again in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. At the close of Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians, he was talking to them about the coming again of Jesus Christ, the glorious day of the Lord. He said, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with the voice of the archangel, the trump of God. The dead in Christ shall rise first, and we who are alive and remain will then be caught up to meet 
the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And then he began to write in chapter 5 concerning the day of the Lord. It will be a glorious day when the Lord comes to reign, but it will first of all be a day of judgment. It is necessary before he established the righteous kingdom of God upon the earth that the kingdom of man be judged and the earth be judged. And so the great tribulation period, the time of God's judgment, which is referred to as the day of his wrath. But Paul assured the believers, they were not appointed unto wrath, but those who had been rebelling against God, those who had been tormenting and torturing God's people, the judgment will come upon them. So here in this second letter, Paul seems to just take up where he left off in the first letter. He begins this second letter with again talking to them concerning the coming of the Lord and the judgment that the Lord will bring when he returns to the earth. Now the believers in Thessalonica have been subjected to a lot of persecution. When Paul was ministering there, he had to flee for his life because they were going to arrest him and uh, going to actually torture him. And thus the brethren said, Paul, get out of here. And he fled during the night. When they couldn't find Paul, they then took the believers and they began to persecute them. They began to imprison them and, and uh, began to uh, actually abuse those who had come to a faith in Jesus Christ. And so Paul is writing to comfort the believers because when you are doing the right thing, seeking to live a right kind of life and people begin to persecute you and they begin to take advantage of you and they begin to make all kinds of false accusations you're prone to wonder Lord why would you allow the wicked to prosper why would you allow these evil people Lord to torture and torment those who are serving you. And so Paul speaks to encourage them. He tells them that he speaks actually of the persecutions and the tribulations that they had endured. He spoke of their suffering for the kingdom of God. And he spoke about those who were troubling them. And he said, when the Lord returns... He'll take care of them. That will be his first order of business. The righteousness of God, he said, will be manifested in his judgments against those who persecuted the church. Verse 5. And he said, it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to those who will trouble you. The tribulation will not be for the church. It will be for those who troubled the church. Throughout the scriptures, there is a consistent declaration that God is going to punish his enemies, those that hate him, those who live in wickedness. Way back in Deuteronomy, God said, if I wet my glittering sword and my hand takes hold on judgment, I will render vengeance to my enemies and I will reward those that hate me. I will make my arrows drunk with blood and my sword shall devour flesh and that with the blood of the slain and of the captives from the beginning of the revengers upon the enemy. Rejoice, O you nations, with his people for he will avenge the blood of his servants and he will render vengeance to his adversaries, and he will be merciful unto his people. 
As we read in Psalm 94 this morning, Shall the throne of iniquity have fellowship with thee, which frameth mischief by a law? They gather themselves together against the soul of the righteous, and they condemn innocent blood. But the Lord is my defense, and my God is the rock of my refuge. And he shall bring upon them their own iniquity and shall cut them off in their own wickedness. Yea, the Lord shall cut them off. During the period known as the Great Tribulation, when God turns all of the fresh water supplies into blood, makes them unpalatable. Revelation chapter 16 tells us of this judgment of God. But when it happens, we are told that the voice of the angel will say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast and shall be, because you have judged thus. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and now you have given them blood to drink, for they are worthy or they deserve it. And I heard another voice out of the altar that said, Even so, Lord God, almighty and true and righteous are thy judgments. One thing we can be certain, and that is when God judges, it will be righteous judgment. It will be fair. When the judgments are completed, Revelation chapter 19, after they are completed, he said, after these things, I heard a great voice of many people in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication. He has avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. God is a God of love. God is gracious. He is merciful. He is good. He is kind. He is forgiving. He is long-suffering. But he is also righteous. And his righteousness demands that the evil be punished. Now, even we ourselves realize that evil should be punished. Many times we are upset when we see people getting by with evil. When we know that they are guilty, and yet because of some mishap in the uh, arraigning of them, perhaps they were not given their rights uh, and told that they had the right not to say anything and, and because that was not shared with them they are set free though they are guilty of the crime and we say that's not fair that's not justice when this fellow a while back raped that little girl I think she was 12 years old at the time cut off her hands threw her body discarded her body thinking she would die when the courts gave such a light sentence to him, I find, found myself just saying, that's not right, that's not fair to do that to this little child and then to get off so easily. And he was, you know, when he was released, I thought, that's not fair. Just a short time in prison for that horrible, atrocious crime. Well, I see that justice has finally caught up with him. He raped and murdered another girl and is now awaiting a court in uh, Florida, and I'm sure that the Florida justice will be more severe than that of California's. But we say that's not right. And, and so often when we see people getting by with evil, we say that's not right. And it isn't. Wickedness should be punished. The guilty should be punished. 
and, and our, our very heart cries out for righteous judgment. What is right, what is fair. And when God judges, we can sure, be sure that it will be in righteousness. In Hebrews chapter 10, we are told, for if we sin willfully after we've come to a knowledge of the truth, there remains no further sacrifice for our sins, but only a certain fearful looking for of the judgment of the fiery indignation by which God will devour his adversaries. For he that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose he would be accounted worthy who has trodden under the foot the Son of God and hath done despite to his spirit of grace? For we know him who has said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. It is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of a living God. It will be a very fearful thing when the wicked fall into the hands of a living God and he in righteousness begins to judge them for their wickedness. Writing to the believers there in Thessalonica who were being persecuted by the wicked people, Paul said in verse 7, To you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire as he takes vengeance upon them that know not God and that do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, banished forever from God's presence presence. That's righteous. If a person doesn't want to live with God now, it would not be fair for God to force them to live with him for eternity. And God will not. They will be banished from the presence of God. But a person doesn't realize how horrible that will be. If there was no influence of the church today in the world, this would be a horrible place to live, much worse than it is already. Because of the waning influence of the church, we see the rising tide of evil in the world. And throughout the world, we are seeing horrible things done against the Christians. In China, we see the persecution of the believers as they are tortured, as they're in prison, as they are beaten, and as they have their possessions confiscated by the government just because they've gathered to worship Jesus Christ. We see that in the Muslim-controlled nations of the persecution of Christians, the imprisonment of Christians. We see even in Iran where they've put many of the believers to death. And of course in the Sudan today, the horrible massacre of the Christians in the Sudan where they come into the village and kill every male in the village and then they take the women and rape them and abuse them and they take the children and sell them into slavery. And we read of this and we say, God, how long will you allow this to happen to your people? And those in Thessalonica that were being persecuted, they were saying, Lord, why do you let them get by with this? And Paul is writing and assuring they're not going to get by with it. The Lord is going to come and he is going to judge in righteousness. Jesus, speaking of that day of judgment, said, Then he will say to those on his left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire that was prepared for the devil and his angels. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. I believe that the world that we are living in today is ripe for the judgment of God. I happen to see on the news, on television, some of the Mardi Gras uh, parade and, and celebration. 
And I thought, where did these people come from? Such an open, blazing display of debauchery, filthiness. The world calls it revelry, but it is absolute debauchery. And you think, who are these people? Where did they come from? And, and the people there, drunken, walking up and down the streets, women exposing themselves and all, you think, what's happening? To, and that's supposed to be a religious celebration. You know, it's, it's uh, we're going to have to be good for the next 40 days, so, you know, let's celebrate. I think, God, help us. When I see pictures of the, the homosexual parade on Father's Day, of all days, Father's Day in San Francisco. <laughs> that parade is, I'm certain that nothing in Sodom and Gomorrah could even compare with that San Francisco Father's Day gay parade. And people applauding. The weird costumes, the weird get-ups, the, the horrible, blasphemous things that they are doing. And you think, God help us. I don't belong here. Certainly the world is ripe for judgment. And when God steps in to establish a righteous reign over the earth, it will be necessary to, first of all, destroy the wicked reign. And when he does, we'll be saying, Holy and true are thy judgments, O Lord. True and righteous are thy ways. God did judge Sodom and Gomorrah. God did judge the world at the time of Noah. And you can be sure that God will judge the wicked. The day of the Lord is a twofold event. It begins with the judgment and it ends with the glorious establishment of the kingdom of God on the earth. And men will put away their implements of war. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. And there will be no more war. The people will live together in peace and in love. No fightings, no disputings, no stealing, no taking advantage of another. But righteousness will reign. And righteousness will cover the earth as the waters do cover the sea. And so Paul is assuring them that the Lord is going to come and those that have troubled them will be judged. Those who persecuted them, the Lord will take care of them and the Lord will establish his people. And Paul is praying. He said, I pray continually that you'll be accounted worthy to be among those who inherit the kingdom of God. When Jesus was talking about the great judgment that is coming upon the earth, the time of great tribulation, and all of the cataclysmic judgments that will come from God against the unrighteousness of man. Jesus said to his disciples, pray ye always that you'll be accounted worthy to escape these things, that is the cataclysmic judgments and to be standing before the Son of Man. Paul picks that up and to the Thessalonians he's saying, I am praying without ceasing. You'll be accounted worthy to be numbered with God's people in that day. And that's my prayer for you. God, help them. Help them to live in righteousness. Help them to live, Lord, a life that pleases you that they'll be accounted worthy to escape 
the wrath of God when it is poured out upon this earth. But you see, it's really up to you. And when the day of the Lord comes, you will be one of two places. He will separate them, it says, as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goat. There will be those on his right hand and those on his left. And you'll be either on the right hand or the left hand of the Lord. The right hand of the Lord hearing his words, well done. Good and faithful servants enter into the joy of the Lord. Or on his left where you will hear, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity, into everlasting judgment. Where will you be? That's all up to you. The Lord calls upon us to repent from our wickedness. The Lord calls on us to surrender our lives to him and live now in his kingdom. To live together in love, to live together in peace. To love one another even as he loves us. To be kind and considerate and forgiving towards each other. Not to be angry with one another, not to be holding grudges, not to be jealous, not to allow bitterness or hatred to fill our hearts, but overcome evil with good. And the Lord is calling us to that kind of a life. Now, if you live that kind of a life, Jesus said, Blessed are you when men persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely. It's not going to be an easy life. People don't like people to live a good life. They get upset. But you can be sure that you're living as God wants you to live. And though the world may persecute you as they did those in Thessaloniki, the Lord will honor you for the stand that you take for righteousness. God help us. Father, we want to live for you. We want to live a life that is right. In this world, Lord, that is wrapped up in itself and in its selfish pursuits, in a world that's gone mad as it has given itself over to its lust, Men living as animals. Oh God, help us to live for Jesus Christ. To stand up against the tide of evil. To dare to make a commitment and keep it. Lord, let us live in a way that pleases you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Shall we stand? I would encourage you today, if you're not sure of your relationship with God, that you're living the life that he wants, that you go back to the prayer room and just Confess your sin and ask the Lord to transform your heart and life and to make you what he would have you to be. There will be pastors and counselors back there to pray with you. But let's live a life that pleases God. Let's live a life of righteousness for his sake.